Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The text this week for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, which is uh, Ordinary 27a, Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7. The continuous, semi-continuous reading is Exodus 20, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9, and 12 through 20. The psalm is 80, verses 7 through 15. The epistle is Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. And our gospel is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. Welcome back, Joy. I made it back and I made it through. It's gr great to be with you. And you guys did way too fine without me. Oh, well, I don't know about that, but we're, we're very glad to have you back. So I hope you enjoyed a little bit of time off and a little rest as we move into uh, these, um, these, this next month of the fall season. So first Sunday in October, and I think you know, one thing to uh, kind of frame this section of Matthew uh, as, we, as we are moving through these latter chapters of Matthew is that we're in, this is the second of three parables where, uh, where Jesus is responding to the leadership. Uh, and, and so it raises this larger question of, of what leadership or what um, tending those who are responsible for tending the kingdom of God, uh, what are we called to do, and what does that and what does that look like? And and particularly at the end of the parable, who will take up that leadership, uh, and what will that leadership look like? And I think that's uh, I think that's an important question right now when we think about uh, when we think about leadership, when we think about um, particularly leadership in the church and and how uh, preachers, you out there are, are, I imagine thinking a lot about what your leadership looks like these days um, in, in the changing realities of, of the pandemic and, and protest and as we move toward the election, at least in, in the states. And so, uh, but it, it's an important question and I think worth some time to, that's one possible direction I would take. And it's particularly, when you get to verse 41 and, uh, and you know, who are gonna be those other tenants? And uh, I, 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 I do wonder sometimes you know, if the persons listening to our sermons also imagine themselves as, as leaders or as those who tend God's kingdom. Um, and that there's not, how is it that a preacher can uh, invite uh invite all of us to think about that responsibility and not just it's not just for designated leaders in the church or it's not just for you know designated leaders either synodically or uh, in adjudicatory or nationally or whatever in the church but this this um wider responsibility for what that what that means so one direction i had thought about I really appreciate that, Caroline. Uh, the perspective I was looking at was asking a similar question. Um, and I framed that question in the question of what are the fruits of the kingdom? Um, uh, addressing that, uh, that uh, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people that produces the fruits of the kingdom in verse 43. Let's not assume that folks understand or even know what those fruits are. And that would be an approach, I think, that would uh, address the question of, uh, that you're asking, Caroline, of what does uh, um, leadership of the followers of Christ look like? And uh, how do we uh, recognize those who are producing the fruits by exploring what are those fruits? Others? It's good you came back just in time for these parables, Joy, because it just gets worse after this one. Um, as, as Jesus hangs out in Jerusalem and in Matthew's gospel. Yeah, I think we have to read this parable in, in light of the context of the rest of the gospel, which has had much to say about producing fruit all the way back to the Sermon on the Mount. 
um, some descriptions of what that looks like in terms of the fruit that are provided to those in the Beatitudes, right? That, that um, they will be the ones who receive the kingdom of God, that they're, they'll, they will be satisfied. There's all these ways Jesus pronounces blessing, which could be synonymous with fruit for, for those kinds of people. He's announced a certain kind of preferential option already. It's also a gospel where he's been unrelentingly negative toward religious leadership and said things like, you know, it's not the healthy who need a physician. I haven't come for you people. I've come for those who are, are sick. And in a lot of ways, this parable pulls all that together. And it's the most violent of all of the three versions of this parable. It's the most disturbing. It's got the, the most alarming history of anti-Jewish interpretation of all three synoptic accounts of this parable. So I think we need to say, first of all, to a preacher, like this is a hard text and this is a disturbing text and you're going to be tempted to find ways to re-engineer it to make it more palatable. But this is a really angry parable about bad religion or about bad religious leadership. And so I would say even, you know, I'd take the focus away a bit from leadership and just talk about religion, which we all participate in which we all generate, sometimes by choice, sometimes because we have no other options. And just take a good hard look at how our religious practices or institutions get caught in um, ways that are not fruitful <laughs> or non-fruit producing, you know, whatever that looks like. But it's a chance to have some real honest conversations about why is Jesus so mad here? And he's mad because there's something about this kind of religion that is uh, fruitless. Well, and I think too, it, uh, the, the, I think one of the ways in which, yes, it's a really difficult parable. And one of the ways that um, we could kind of wiggle out of that or make it a little bit more palatable is, is a kind of us versus them sort of uh, reality that this is, is, you know, this is, uh, which have which of course leads to some of the uh, problems in in the history of interpretation that you're talking about, Matt, in terms of of uh, contributing to anti-Semitism. So it's really easy to say, well, I'm not that kind of leader, or uh, that you know Jesus is just talking about you know the bad leaders back then, and um, and that's one way. That's one really really convenient way to wiggle out of and not and not recognize the way in which that, that lens is also cast on yourself. And so I think you're, uh, you're pointing us to the direction of religion and how is it that we tend religious practices and how is it that we tend religiosity could be a helpful way for, could be a helpful way for, for present day leaders and present day persons tending the kingdom of God uh, to say, yeah, where, where is it that I'm not bearing that fruit um, and having a, a uh, hard look at that. The um, one of the things I find interesting about these this series of passages um, is, that, first of all, it's set in the temple. So Jesus says, in Jerusalem already, you know, we get this at the end of our church year instead of uh, like right before the passion story, uh, which I think changes it. Um, and then all these different groups of uh, first century Judaism, of, uh, right, of uh, the Judaism of Jesus' day come to him. Um, the, the first set of parables is uh, directed to the chief priests and elders. Um, and so I think that's important. And then at the end here, it says the chief priests and Pharisees. Then uh, the next will be in a couple of weeks, the Pharisees and Herodians together, which is interesting. Then it skips our, the lectionary skips the one about the Sadducees and then finally a scribes. So it's um, all of the different groups are coming to him. And it seems to me that his, that uh, the, the, the critique Jesus has for each of them is, is different. Um, I'm not sure Jesus is angry. Uh, it's interesting how you have to, we always have to supply the emotions to biblical texts, but he's certainly, uh, it's certainly a hostile. Uh, but what about the parable itself? We haven't really talked about the, um, the parable itself about th that the, um, the owner sends his son finally uh, to the disobedient um, 
vineyard workers? Oh, Ralph, I wish you hadn't have asked that question. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I was, I've been thinking about this since Matt was speaking, and um, uh, the, the reason that uh, I, I, I say it uh, justly uh, um, uh, in, in humor um, is that one of the ways that this text has often been preached to avoid really dealing with um, uh, what we've been talking about is by focusing on Jesus. And so when I was reading this text and thinking about our podcast, I so wanted to play with this idea of it's always about God and, and what is it saying? And let's talk about the stone that the builders rejected. And let's talk about um, all of the analogies that have been used with the parable. And I caught myself and I'm really putting it in the context not just of the text, but also of the context of this moment. And Ralph, you just brought that up again when you started naming who's being addressed. The, um, the uh, Pharisees, the Herodians, the uh, scribes, the, uh, the, the various groups. And that's exactly where we are today. We have labeled ourselves so that we have an in-group and an out group. And is it possible that we are missing that what is going on here is for us to take advantage of the cultural moment and call ourselves to accountability that these might be the word, that this metaphor might be the words that um, we need to hear for ourselves. Having said that, I'm going to turn back for us to discuss Ralph's question, because it's a great question. We haven't talked about what that metaphor, what that parable actually is, but I definitely wanted to put it in that context. So thanks for letting me add that. I think the specificity of who he's talking to here is really important for answering that question, but also that what you were talking about, Joy. I mean, he's in verse 23, this is the chief priests and the elders. I mean, we're talking about the Jerusalem elite that are the the audience so it's this is not a, a parable or a sermon to the masses or to all israel necessarily and then in verse 45 it's the chief priests and the pharisees so there's a bit of a, a switch there which is pretty consistent with how matthew views pharisees and their power in jerusalem um in, in, as this gospel goes forward so i mean it's this idea of sending the son is i think still an extension of this question about authority that, that comes up prior to this, to this parable, that we've got a, really a showdown in this parable between those who are considered the prime authority figures in the Jerusalem temple cult and, and all that that means religiously, all that that means politically, all that that means in terms of conciliation with Rome. But then you've got this idea of the son of this, this sense of, of, of um, if we're going to equate the, the, the landowner with God here as one with, who bears all the authority of the one who has absolute claim over everything. Um, if I can you know, use that language here to talk about God. So there is a, there's a reckoning that's going on here that gets at the heart of how do we, where does religious authority come from? Like what's, what is the role of a human institution in that? And where do we discern God speaking for God's self in the midst of these kinds of things? I, 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 have, two, uh, I have two things to say uh, directly about uh, the passage. Uh, one, uh, one is that the most violent reaction, the, the most violent verse in the parable is the reaction of the chief priests and elders. It's not Jesus himself. Uh, so, you know, because so in verse 40, after the parable, he says, so, so what will the owner of the vineyard do when he comes? And they go, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other. Right? So, so that, again, it's, it's a little bit of weasel exegesis. Uh, uh, that, but to, to, just to note that, that that totally violent reaction, that's from the chief priests and elders. Um, the other thing is... Uh, to pick up on what you were just saying at the end, Matt, I mean, the parable itself is about God's action of sending his son to die. Um, and so, I mean, whether we look at this as a Matthean 
you know, a, a parable that Matthew is, is uh, relating for his community later, obviously after the uh, crucifixion and resurrection or Jesus um, speaking this in the week he knows because uh, he's announced several times in the gospel that he's going to die. It's, it's a Christological parable about, about the nature of God's redeeming action. I want to add one more thing, and uh, maybe it's time to uh, move on. But the, the another direction I thought about with this parable, particularly when you think about uh, how to um, how to make the parable not just about uh, well, this is only a parable about leaders in the church, and it's not about me um, for the for the for the people who are listening to this passage and people who are listening to the sermon. And I think if you, uh, it might be, I was thinking of pairing this with the Isaiah passage. Yes, there is a focus on, you know, obviously the focus on, on God and God's care of the vineyard and such, but, but the, the, the call to what kind of uh, tending or what kind of fruit we will produce. I think one question I would ask is, of my listeners is what is it that you are caring for right now to further the kingdom of God? Um, it's a different kind of question than what kind of fruits are you bearing, but what is it that you're caring for? What is it that you're attending? Uh, you know, not necessarily a vineyard, but what is your vineyard? Uh, what is your, what is your place and space that you are nurturing that you, that you have uh, oversight of, uh, or you have a, or you have some agency in uh, that you, that, albeit however small, that you say, yeah, this is this is how I am furthering the kingdom of God, particularly in a time when people aren't aren't uh, able to uh, embody those kinds of expressions of of their faith uh, during uh, you know when we're still. In, when we're still worshiping, not the way we want to worship. And uh, so that would be, a, a, it's a little bit different direction, a little bit different question, but that would be another, I think another homiletical um, trajectory one could take. Isaiah, any other way you would relate Isaiah? I, it's about a vineyard, did you notice? I, I had a hard time not just jumping right into Isaiah when we started this because this is one of those texts or these texts just weave into each other. Uh, and I think a lot of what we said about the gospel is in this text, uh, uh, clearly the memory of uh, the ancient Hebrew scriptures being called upon uh, to uh, in the uh, imaginations of the first century listeners of Jesus as he's telling this uh, gospel parable. Um, and I pulled out what more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not yet done. Again, the action of God, the question of God uh, in, in terms of, and, and I, I'll lean into what you just said, Caroline, in terms of God has done what God has done to set this venue for humanity to live out our vocation. And as you are asking, so how are we responding? And this is, this is a moment where ancient Israel has, and this, this Matt is what I wanted to say when, when you were in the gospel, have produced wild grapes. It was, it was not the fruit that they were supposed to be producing. And, uh, and, and so that, that, that centers around that same calling back of what it is that God has been doing and what God expects of, of, God's, of God's people. And Ralph, I hadn't thought about it until you made clear that sense of where did the anger come from? Uh, where did the most violence and hostility come from? Um, wow, is that not what we're doing? You know, the, here's a text where God is calling to God's people saying, you know, I've set this up for you to offer good, good grapes, good fruit, and, and all I'm getting from you is wildness. And, and so, Ralph, for you to note that the most hostility is coming from God's people might invite us to read uh, even this Isaiah text with that same lens. Most of the wildness usually does come from Ralph, actually. <laughs> That's right. I'm the wild one. You are the wild one. <laughs> 
this is such a great uh, this is such a great parable <laughs> that it does deserve to be preached on its own uh, at some point uh, by all preachers. Uh, the the rhetorical strategy is it starts off as uh, the, you know the prophet Isaiah is uh, during the time of the divided kingdom right so Israel and Judah which comes back in verse seven. He starts off by singing a love song for my beloved. And so then you, and then he's using, if you, if you look at the song of songs, this, uh, the imagery of plants for the beloved, uh, uh, you know, agricultural imagery for the beloved is kind of strange in our, uh, in our world, although the, although the commentary on the website uh, does find a couple analogs uh, in our culture, but it's, this is the normal language, how people talked about their beloved. And so, you, it starts off by thinking it's just about the beloved, but then, and then it invites the people to judge between me and the vineyard, sort of similar, I guess, to the way Jesus asks his audience to, to say, well, what should the owner do? But, uh, but then at a certain point it changes and you realize, oh no, this is God, because it's, you know, um, I will command the, the clouds that they not rain upon it. Well, obviously only God can do that. So then it, it so it draws the people in through this rhetorical strategy. And then like a lot of parables, right? It switches, it flips on them. And in the end, you get this announcement that what does God want, but justice and righteousness. And um, then it stops, right? It's just an announcement of condemnation and it's just an oracle of doom uh, in its setting. Matt, I want to give you a space to jump in there, but I, I, I'm also looking in light of what Rolf just said, I'm turning to that Psalm as a response uh, to that condemnation. I'm holding my breath. What do you want me to do then? The Psalm or Isaiah? I'm, I, you could do either one. If you want to stay with Isaiah, I'll, I'll wait. Uh, I'll just say one quick thing about Isaiah. I mean, it's similar to the parable in, in Matthew 21 that, that the preacher needs to fill in some wider context. So what, what are wild grapes in this setting? Chuck Aaron on, the, on his commentary does a nice job of saying, read on to verse eight and you'll see that part of what it is is exploitation of the poor. Um, similar in Matthew 21, right? I mean, in, in, in Isaiah five, the problem is the vineyard's not producing the way it should. Something's wrong. It's just not producing what it was meant to produce. In, I, in Matthew 21, the vineyard seems to be fine. It's the leadership are withholding something. They're not being responsible stewards. But then we have to ask the question, what is that? So that people don't hear bearing fruit as, I really think I should be nicer to my neighbor, or I should probably, you know, rake their leaves as well as my own. I mean, things that are, yeah, important, but, um, there's really weighty stuff going on in here. The problem with the chief priests and the elders in Matthew is <laughs> they are loading on more obligations uh, upon people. They are making religion onerous and not liberative to people. And so you've just gotta, I think, fill in the, the, the bigger story in both of those, right? What's the problem in Isaiah? This gets at the pathos of that, but the preacher has to help define that. And if, yeah, if you're looking for good news in either one of these passages, I suppose you do have to run to the psalm um, for, some, for some help there, perhaps. Or to call... That God never totally gives up, right, and lets things get overrun without moving toward restoration. Or to call for that, uh, um, uh, uh, to use Caroline's move, uh, liturgically uh, as a prayer. Restore us. If, if we actually, if the preacher actually takes the time to name the reality that either the Old Testament or the New Testament parable is describing, the response is to hear it, to acknowledge it, and to say, we need your face to shine on us, God. We need you to restore us in order for us to produce what you are asking us to produce. It's easy to vilify the chief priests and the scribes as these horrible people, but they're, they're the religious elite. They're the best of the best, right? If they can't get it right, why should I expect that I'm able to? Um, so you need a God who's going to restore. I just, if there's any good news in these three passages, it's only in Psalm 80 and it's only in the belief that God might yet um, 
do something that involves me. <laughs> well, I, I think the good news in the, uh, in the Matthew parable is that God sends the son, uh, which is the stone that's rejected that becomes the cornerstone. That seems like that's the fundamental good news of the Christian proclamation. Amen. That's pretty yeah, good news. How do I know it includes me? And that's in that parable. Well, like you said, you have to go in broader context, you have to find it, but it, it but it's seems to me that, that that's awfully good news. Um, I, um, part of the, part of the problem with the, um, the parable in Psalm 80, or it's not the parable, it's, it's the metaphor of the vineyard, right? So the vineyard metaphor goes way back in Israel's history. Um, multiple prophets use it and, and, and it's used. And, and part of, uh, I know, I know, Matt, in years past, you have not enjoyed uh, the Psalm 80, uh, in part because here's a, here's, here's a Israelite supersession of Canaanites, right? You, you brought a vine, you drove, you drove out the nations and planted it, right? And then, you know, you get to harvest uh, grapes from vineyards that you didn't plant, live in houses that you didn't build, right? That's the, you know, uh, going back to Joshua and so forth. It's uh, you've got the same issue of supersessionism that we're afraid of in Psalm 21, uh, Matthew 21, and we should be here in Psalm 80. So it's a multifaceted problem. Let's jump though to, let's jump to the semi-continuous uh, Old Testament uh, reading. For people that use the semi-continuous um, uh, pathway of the of the lectionary. I want to suggest that they might want to think about doing three weeks in Exodus starting this week. Um, there's a, a, a great, you know, could, a, a wonderful little mini series you can do between here and then next week, Exodus 32, and the following week, Exodus 34. Here, what you're getting is um, the Ten Commandments, um, and um, I, I've taught for many years uh, on the Ten Commandments and congregations and at the seminary. And one of the most interesting things is I ask people, when's the last time, I ask the adults, when's the last time you studied the Ten Commandments? And one of the answers I often get in the Lutheran church is, I haven't studied them since I was a teenage confirmation student studying the small catechism. Uh, which is interesting that we teach the Ten Commandments to children, even though they're addressed to adults, right? You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, a sort of adult sins. And so it's a chance to talk about um, the goodness um, of the free life that God is offering the people, that these are, as my uh, beloved doctor father uh, of blessed memory talked about, that this is what freedom looks like. They've been, uh, the Israelites have been freed from oppression, and now God is giving them uh, commandments, uh, the, the gift of a gracious law, to show them how free people live in relationship with God and relationship with one another. Yeah, and I think I, I think the the first question uh, in the commentary really is the summary of it. Uh, and it and like you said, uh, Rolf, it you know the way in which we so individualize the commandments and and make sure that you know we're obeying them and and as these rules and laws that you have to follow. And just by that, that question that it seems like we forget all the time when it comes to the Ten Commandments, but that question of what does it mean to belong to a community? Uh, it's not just about you. Uh, it's about the good of your neighbor and, and it's about staying in relationship with God. And so the way that she, uh, Vanessa Loveless cast that in, in that part of the, the the, this wider theme of belonging and belonging um, comes with responsibilities and it comes with accountability. And, uh, and so I, it's, it really is extraordinary how often when we, you know, it comes to the 10 commandments that we have to have that reminder that this is about what is it, what does it look like to belong to a community? And I, uh, and and I think that could have some interesting resonances right now when, uh, when there's a lot of uh, discussion around what, what do I do? Uh, am I, how, am I, how am I going to attend my neighbor? Am I going to wear a mask and not wear a mask? Uh, I think that, I mean, this is sort of the subterranean theme of that. What does it mean to belong to a community? It's not just about you. Uh, and, there, and, and also how you act out 
how you are with your neighbor, um, your tending of that relationship with your neighbor is a direct, uh, is a direct uh, uh, continuation or expression of your relationship with God. So you have the first three, you know, first three commandments about that maintaining that relationship with God and then, you know, out to the neighbor. So it's, you know, you're, we don't, we don't talk about, uh, we don't talk about being kind to your neighbor or how you are with your neighbor, or how you are in community. Uh, it, it cannot be talked about without going back to how does this actually express what your relationship with God is. And I think that would be a worthwhile sermon. And I know we're talking uh, at length about this one, but um, a few years ago, one of my students shared that um, they were taught to think of the commandments uh, as what a community of, that has, is free has the freedom to do. And um, in, in light of having experienced depression and, and been uh, uh, enslaved, they now have the freedom to trust their heritage, which was the problem for why they got in, in, in enslaved in the first place. Honor your heritage, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long has to do with not just um, asking for your individual life, but your communal life, Caroline, as you were saying, my people, their heritage can be affirmed to affirm the life of the community. Don't murder, don't lie, don't, don't steal. Um, um, I have the freedom to trust that God will provide and I don't have to covet or take what is someone else. I have the freedom to look at uh, each of the commandments in a positive way, as opposed to just looking at as I can't, I can't, I can't. So um, just, um, I, I just, that, that's just an exciting way for me to look at that, that, that text, uh, particularly for, for folks who were taught it as a rule when they were a child. How do I come back to it? So we've talked too long. <laughs> How about um, <clears throat> the best quick things, <clears throat> your best quick word on Philippians 3? I would say that um, it fits with the other text. You know I'm going to say that. It fits with the other text because of what, what uh, this background here of Paul is saying is that everything that I think I am is nothing compared to what it is that I have gained in Christ. My little nugget, you, oh, my little, my little nugget is, uh, you know, it, each preacher has to determine what their congregation needs to hear every week. But if your congregation uh, needs to hear uh, pastoral care and promise and hope, uh, that uh, those last uh, those last three verses of the passage, because Christ Jesus has made me His own, and uh, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. Uh, that might be that might be the word of hope and the word of promise that people need to hear this week. I think it's potentially dangerous that this text shows up on the same Sunday as the parable in Matthew 21. Your, your anti-Judaism siren should be going off in your office as you prepare your sermon, just to make sure that you aren't quickly assuming that what Paul's doing here is denigrating Judaism or somehow that you're going to kind of lump the villains of the parable in Matthew 21 with um, this notion of, of self-righteousness or of kind of legalism or something like that in a, in a simplistic way. It's the the value of this passage or the the beauty of this passage is it situates you like the whole book of philippians does which is uh, still along the way that you've you've not arrived um, but you continue to be in this place where you're working out your salvation um, that that notion of becoming like jesus in his death and pressing on this is a book that situates us not at the end of the journey uh, but as one claimed by god and and pressing forward <clears throat> 